Hello, and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab talk. I'm Sarah Wallison. I'm the director of the MIT Open Documentary Lab. And today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Caitlin Robinson. Uh, Caitlin is an immersive media producer working for a lot of the key studios in the field, Electric South and Raycaster, and now Scatter, where she is uh, building creative possibilities for Depth Kit, which is a data capture tool for volumetric filmmaking. She's also working on building that community and ecosystem. Um, she's been a documentary filmmaker. She's done work, investigative journalism work for BBC and Al Jazeera, and worked on uh, award-winning immersive experiences such as Lalac and Watertight, which is a 3D uh, printed specimen collection of New Yorkers in their homes. Today, she's going to be talking about um, how you create characters and identity um, with emerging technologies and, and the challenges and implications of creating nonfiction characters using these techniques and technologies. Um, she'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then uh, our fellows will respond, and then we will open it up to, to you. So please put your questions in the Q&A, and we will uh, open it up to you to ask questions then. So without further ado, Caitlin Robinson. Thank you so much for the warm intro, Sarah. It's a real honor to be uh, chatting to you all, and particularly, you know, congratulations to this, this year's group of, of fellows. It's extraordinary work that you're all doing, and Really, really pleased to be uh, talking to you today. Um, so uh, let me get started and share uh, my screen. Can you all see my screen now? I'm gonna go ahead and, and guess that that's a yes, unless I hear otherwise. So um, as Sarah said, I kind of began my career um, producing kind of traditional documentary film, investigative journalism um, in my home country, South Africa. Um, and it was sort of started a decade ago and, and almost half of my career has, has now been in the kind of immersive space. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with um, VR reality creators on projects, you know, from Lagos through to Nairobi. And what typically draws me to projects is things like landscape and textures and environments and colors. Um, so my migration to working on more immersive media projects widened my canvas there. Um, so when I was thinking about what to talk about um, with you all today, um, I thought I would talk about place and placemaking, um, since after all, immersive media gives us the opportunity to be somewhere. Um, but at a time when we're so geographically disconnected, um, I was reflecting, reflecting on um, you know, why any of the projects that I've worked on really matter. Um, and it's because of the people in the stories. Um, there is no story without character. Um, and we tell stories really to connect to a sort of shared humanity. But of course, there is no character unless we actually construct the representation of a person in documentary. Um, so today I want to talk about a, a bit about some of the techniques I've used in my documentary work to kind of paint a picture of who real world individuals are. There's all sorts of vernacular in 2D film for the construction of character. So I'm gonna go back to the basics and start from my traditional roots and talk a bit about that first, um, and then sort of compare that to what we're finding in new media. Um, so it's both kind of a, a point of departure and a, a point of reference, if you will. Um, so what do you see here? A typical stock standard documentary character um, introduction would be this medium close up, um, sometimes with lower thirds, with a company name or title. Um, so here is Joe Exotic. Um, disclaimer, I have absolutely no affiliation with the Tiger King show on Netflix at all, um, other, having, other than having binge watched it, I'm sure, with all of the rest of you. Um, but what we see in the shot, it's you know, set up so that the subject's gaze is, is just off to the side of the camera lens. It's at a height that's nice and neutral, not above or below. Um, and the eye line is sort of a, a clue um, about the presence of the interviewer. We call this a you know talking head it's effective but um, sometimes a bit monotonous maybe and so you know mix it up by uh, you know change the shot scale you punch in for a close-up here um, you can switch the angle or it can be a bit jarring um, try not to jump cut um, you can have your camera on a slider for a nice tracking shot you can reverse the angle go black and white um, in short there's really just a trove of common visual techniques that audiences expect and documentarians can lean on um, to present sort of a basic character 
And these techniques have been invented over time. So I can think about the language of these visual mechanisms through the lens of semiotics, which is a study of sign systems, where a sign consists of the signifier and it's signified. So at its most explicit level, uh, a stop sign. It's literally just red and white paint on an octagonal metal plate, um, but it conveys this concept of an instruction for um, a road user. And another example, I mean, here we have a collection of the eight letters that make up the English word scribble. Um, and that can conjure an image in your mind of, of what a, a scribble is. And it's likely that the image you have in your mind is quite different than this scribble you see in front of your face here. The framework can also accommodate metaphor and abstraction. So here is the spinning top, which is the closing shot of um, Inception, the movie. And if this top keeps spinning, uh, it means that Leonardo DiCaprio's character is in a dream. But if it stops and falls over, it means that he's in reality. And this symbol is so achingly frustrating um, because that meaning is never determined by the signifier itself. Um, the meaning or what is signified is constructed in the mind of the viewer. And we don't know for sure what is true with this top. So we hold both possible signifiers, it's real or it's um, not um, at the same time. So to apply this framework to character creation, this collection of color pixels of a medium shot is a signifier while the actual whole human being and the person, the person's identity um, is the signified, where right? Joe Exotic is the human being that we are trying to tell a story about. So I like to think about this as representation and identity. Um, and audiences generally accept that, you know, a shot, the shot that winds up on your screen is a valid representation of, of the actual person because of all the examples that we've seen um, that come before. Um, so what is signified is it's influenced by the documentary character. It's very influenced by the storyteller and the choices that they're making, but it's primarily determined by the audience um, and their context and their expectations. So in between this representation and the identity, uh, there is the magical world of how the sausage is made um, in documentary craft. Um, and so the person in the world is interpreted by a camera and a mic and a crew and a director and an editor and the footage is compressed to meet certain software and it's parsed into file formats that can have and handle color and light and time in certain ways. Um, and even once the footage is ready to screen, it's still got to be filtered by newsroom gatekeepers or social media algorithms or whatever else it is that takes to get it, you know, to your, to your eyes and ears. So now when we talk about immersive media, um, that, that toolkit for documentary craft, that pipeline is expanding and it's even more of a jumble of fun possibilities. Um, and at the audience level, we haven't yet developed fully a shared cultural meaning um, of what the new things that we're seeing actually represent. But what's not changing is the real humans driving the stories that we tell. There's always a risk um, in documentary that your characters won't have agency and they'll lose control over how they're represented. Um, and that risk is even higher when we start introducing tools to the mix that, that mean a character can be constructed in the absence of their, the human that's signified beneath them. So this is kind of my academic framework that sets the stage for how I want to think about document, documentary characters. Um, and now I can jump into some examples of my work um, and storytelling choices that um, I've come across. So first up, I have um, Azibuye. Um, uh, at the beginning of this year, I went to Sundance with this 360 short film that I produced, um, it explores themes of capitalism and social justice in South Africa. It tells the story of artists who take up occupation of an abandoned mansion as an act of defiance against property laws that entrench the economic inequality um, and the kind of legacy of colonialism and apartheid. This is the project's brilliant director, Dylan Valley. Um, and he comes from quite an esteemed background as a traditional documentary director. And so the language of classic documentary is very much present in the story, um, but it was shot with a 360 camera. I can see in all directions. Um, and so there's some kind of nuance and different choices that, that um, had to be made there. Um, I will play a little teaser trailer for you. South Africa is a very rich country. It's got mineral wealth, it's got human resources, it's got infrastructure. That has been the back on which they've managed to provide very substandard housing in the outskirts of the cities. 
what, what we are saying here is that actually, the fact is, he has land sitting in the city, the state, and that's what we've done. What is interesting about, um, I guess, the documentary set is that there's this typically, this kind of consensual lie that we all agree to, whereas filmmakers, we ask our subjects to pretend that the crew is invisible and we ask them to go about their actions naturally. Um, with the omniscience of a, a 360 shot, uh, Dylan, as the, as the director, couldn't physically be um, the intruder in the scene um, because he would be in the shot. So he couldn't direct from this kind of first person perspective behind the camera. There is no behind the lens. Um, and so instead we left characters alone in rooms with the camera. And this doesn't necessarily mean that their behaviors are totally unaffected by the presence of a you know, funny looking machine, um, but it's certainly a different type of performativity um, under the, you know, than you'd get sort of under the direct observation of other people. Uh, in terms of choosing, you know, what, what shots to, to get, we didn't have the luxury of, of sort of forcing people's attention to that standard medium close up as the intro shot. Um, although you can place a camera closer to a viewer, you don't necessarily know um, where, uh, uh, or you can place a camera closer to the subject, you don't necessarily know where the viewer um, is going to be looking. Um, so our editor cleverly used sort of spatial audio, um, particularly in one scene, to track footsteps across a room. So that you would sort of raise your attention would be at a certain spot once you cut to, um, to a, a protagonist um, entering a room. When it came to interviews, Dylan had to make a choice um, about the relationship between the characters and the audience. And this kind of neutral eyeline that we often expect in a documentary interview where, you know, your, your eyeline is just off to the side of the, the lens, it wasn't possible here um, unless you have the presence of the interviewer as well, because you can see where the character is looking. Um, and so you can't sort of cheat that, the sort of um, imagined interviewer off screen. So what Dylan decided to do, instead of having um, himself be present, um, uh, had the, the characters gaze directly into the camera. And the effect uh, situates you in the, as the viewer in the room with the character. You're, you're really embedded in the story um, and that sort of makes you complicit in co-occupying the house with these, these folks who are um, artists who are taking up residence there, you know, for taking a political stance um, against uh, uh, entrenched uh, property laws. Um, so when you're in a VR headset, I mean, the, this, what you're seeing on your screen on a 2D screen um, looks sort of like a detached medium close-up shot. Um, but when you're seeing this uh, from the perspective of a VR headset, you know, you're almost uh, on Evan's lap. Um, and so you sort of feel the character in your face. So another uh, project that I worked on um, where you feel this sort of effect of um, direct eye contact um, uh, that technique was used by another director I had the pleasure of collaborating with um, Shelley Barry on her VR project called Here. So this is a, a shot from that project. Um, in Here, Johannesburg performers with disabilities reimagine their city as an inclusive stage for a fantastical happening. In Shelley's own words, um, typical images of people with disabilities are of asexual beings in need of care, to be pitied as victims, or on the other extreme as inspiration porn, the superhero who lives their lives against all odds. I want to create a space for the intersections between being queer and a woman of color and a person with a disability, a narrative that doesn't veer between tragedy and triumph. With my documentary cam camera on my lap, I could design my world and be in charge of constructing images of my life. And that's exactly what she did in this project. So this is Shelley, this is the director Shelley Barry um, on the set of here. Uh, the wheelchair is her own, it's been her, her mode of locomotion, her whole adult life. The costume that she's wearing was specially commissioned by a, a local designer. And the sphere on top of her head is a 360 camera. She's inhabiting this camera rig, which means that her body becomes your player character when you watch the experience. You adopt her literal uh, perspective as a wheelchair user. Uh, at the climax of here, the cast of performers circles all around you uh, as a viewer and, and returns the gaze. Um, it's intentionally confrontational. It flips the script on the representation of disability and forces you to consider not being the audience, um, but you being the signified yourself. 
So the third project I want to show you today takes a different approach entirely to bodies and representation. Uh, currently in post-production, Container is an immersive installation directed by Dr. Meghna Singh, who you see here, um, and the Emmy-nominated filmmaker, Simon Wood. Um, and this deals, the project deals with uh, bearing witness to the invisibilized. This is Clifton Beach. It's a fancy holiday spot in Cape Town where I'm based now. And this is a shot from their project container. So just a few hundred meters offshore of, of Clifton Beach, there's a shipwreck. Um, and in, in 1794, 212 slaves drowned. Their hands and legs were sh shackled in that ship. Most beachgoers have no idea that that wreck is even there. And they tend to ignore that piece of our history. Meanwhile, above water, shipping containers chug by on these enormous vessels um, and contemporary forms of indentured servitude continue today in service of our supply of material goods. So with this VR project, Magna places you inside shipping containers where you witness magical realist scenes of the human labor, labor beneath our consumer culture. To start the experience, you first place a VR headset on, um, you step inside an actual physical shipping container and then witness uh, a, a facsimile of that created in a digital sense. Um, but as soon as you put on this VR headset, you lose your own body. So even though you can reach out and touch the walls um, and you feel that correlation, you no longer see any of your limbs. So your inferred presence, but this absence of corporeality, it reads as the loss of your personal signifier. And so to start this experience, you first need to experience the invisibilization of modern slavery on a visceral level. And then the characters are revealed and you go through um, these scenes uh, where you meet um, folks in different circumstances. The project blends reenactments with real footage um, of real dock workers who are um, loading shipping containers um, around Cape Town. I will show you the trailer. So what is identity anyway? Um, and must it be contained within a human body? Um, this is a quote um, from way back in 2009, um, published in a journal um, exploring uh, the relationship between, uh, uh, I guess, physical people in the real world and, and kind of how people are interacting online in digital spaces. And so now 10 years down the line, digital spaces um, mean so much more than just, you know, uh, uh, maybe social media, you know, your Facebook wall. Um, we're talking about, you know, Zoom conferences um, and, and virtual worlds. 2009 is actually the year that the movie Avatar uh, was released. And the concept of avatars, I think it's becoming increasingly salient now. Um, I think that this, uh, this quote still holds true, uh, or it, it lends some interesting perspective um, on the kind of space that we find ourselves in today. 
Uh, so I'll go ahead and read it. Um, in everyday non-digitally interfaced life, personal identity doesn't have a material form other than that of the body. The image of the body therefore takes on disproportionate importance in the image that people create for themselves of a person compared to his or her intellectual activity, for example, which is abstracted from this representation. In reality, the body immediately grants existence to the person, allowing him or her to be visible to others and thus to construct his or her identity through differentiation. On the screen, the person must take on existence. If he or she doesn't act and doesn't leave traces of him or herself, he or she is invisible to another. This need to take on existence by leaving traces is a radical change in the paradigm of identity. So I don't know if I fully agree with the idea that the body is the only um, structure that holds um, identity, but it's certainly interesting to, interesting to think about what are the vessels and, and what are the kind of um, visuals that communicate um, between, between ourselves. So the last project that I um, want to share with you today um, is a project that I did in collaboration with this extraordinary uh, creative technologist, Zeev Schneider. It's called the Watertight Collection, um, and it's an incomplete archive of the infrastructure that supports single occupant living in New York City. Each specimen in this collection is a home and the individual who inhabits it. So here we have Ali, um, who is in her tiny micro apartment. Um, basically, what you, the, sc the scale of what you see around you is the, the full size of her apartment, but printed um, as a miniature. We wanted to tell the story of the growing trend of people living alone, and um, particularly in, in big cities like New York. Today, more than half of the dwellings in Manhattan are single occupant households. And it's uh, really quite extraordinary to think about. That's never been possible in the 10,000 year history of humanity. Humans have never been able to just live by themselves. We've always needed um, a society around us to sustain ourselves. Um, but now uh, mechanisms are available that you know, we can uh, choose to live by ourselves. Um, and so people do. So we started visiting people in their homes. Uh, this is Jerry. Um, and we used a static volumetric scan, recorded the individual um, and their environment at the same time. Um, and we then 3D printed each person to create a permanent record for our so-called specimen collection. So this is also Jerry. Um, using the, the technique that I've described of um, volumetric scanning, um, we were able to kind of capture a snapshot of him um, in his home. We we're influenced by hermit crabs and, and Polly Pocket, and each, each print is a miniature. It's clearly small enough to fit in your hand. Um, but what I really love about this is that it doesn't feel like Jerry is separate from his home. His home is sort of part of his identity. It's part of what makes up who he is. Um, in his particular case, uh, he is living in a, in a rent stabilized apartment um, and is unlikely to ever leave um, because of you know, the um, economic structures. Uh, and so he's been there for decades um, and will you know, most likely spend the rest of his life there. Um, because you know he lives alone the habitat isn't entirely self-contained um, and he's sort of filled the space with the material embodiments of his personal history um, so everything that you, that you see around him um, is something that he's chosen and he's you know constructed um, to kind of tell the story of his life so each printed portrait in our watertight collection is this kind of tangible manifestation of a life in progress Here's me during uh, that shoot <laughs> process, hiding in a, a bathroom with my sound gear on and um, volumetric uh, uh, depth sensor and uh, makeshift wand. Um, as a documentarian, this technique that we were using was really compelling to me because we could capture a subject from all angles instead of the kind of single point of view um, of the two-dimensional replica and 2D video that I was used to working in. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. You know, maybe this could reduce some of the subjectivity of the filmmaker's point of view, um, perhaps. Um, but what you know we discovered is that you know any tool has got its its limitations, um, and there's something you know very appealing about the very techiness of this this technology that feels somehow like it's a machine. It'll be objective, um, but there's lots of things that is not good at, at at capturing about the real world. And I guess it's up to us just to decide 
what um, the confines of the boundaries, the limits of uh, you know what we we term reality and the, and the truth are, and, and what we need to capture in order to convey that. So here are a bunch of things that this um, depth sensor is not particularly good at. It's useless at exteriors, can't capture any sound, um, and like basically any um, capture device that I know of, whether that's a camera or anything else, it's un incapable of 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 capturing the meaning and the significance of objects because that's constructed sort of at the this uh, where the, where somebody actually receives it where somebody views it. Um, this particular technology is uh, not adept at any kind of bright light or reflections. Um, the way that we used it meant that it couldn't capture movement, and as a result, then it couldn't capture change. And and those are things that are in a lot of ways sometimes essential to what makes a person a person, what makes a character a character and couldn't connect, capture connections between places, between the different specimens in our collection. They all exist as sort of um, individual silos um, and it couldn't capture these connections between the people. But what it did do uniquely, um, both the hardware capture device um, as well as the processing software that we used contributed these really unexpected glitches and these organic visual artifacts. And so in some ways, the, the technology itself became this documentarian um, operating alongside us. So we had our point of view about who these people were, and so did this machine. And we couldn't control necessarily what the output would be. It wasn't um, fixed, you know, there's, it's kind of glitch based. So, so every time, you know, it, it would see something new. Um, and so it interpreted the world, the reality with this ambiguous algorithm, and the end result seems to be the world through the eyes of a machine. So what you're seeing rotating here is uh, the same image that you saw at the, at the start of, of Ali in her micro apartment. Um, this is the process or the, the step bef uh, where we, right before we uh, print the 3D model into a physical model in the world. One of the uh, takeaways for me in working on this watertight project was an awareness of time and, and, and temporality. So we captured uh, scans between 2014 and 2016 um, and during that time, there was such rapid, rapid development um, in the, the VR ecosystem and sort of the XR space as a whole, um, that it seemed like any platform that we might build a volumetric immersive experience for um, would go the way of iPods and CD-ROMs and brontosauruses. Um, so instead of uh, choosing to represent the 3D scans that we were creating um, at kind of room scale in virtual environments where um, you know, the viewer could walk through the space uh, and see the things at, at, at life size. Um, we instead chose 3D printing. Um, 3D printing a rep representation of these people um, and their lives was our way of sort of creating a permanent ar archive um, and giving importance to these transient stories, uh, which in some ways kind of helped us tell the story of uh, housing infrastructure in New York in general, um, which, you know, folks are trying to live a new lifestyle of living alone in inherited architecture um, that's you know dozens of years old and doesn't keep pace with the social changes that are happening. So some fun facts. Um, the oldest building in New York is 368 years old. The expected lifespan of an American human is 79 years old. The production span of the depth sensor that we used on this particular project was only seven years that that technology was created and sold. And the lifespan of plastic arguably is indefinite. So uh, there's a, sort of a plastic polymer that is used um, in 3D printing, um, which means that uh, the specimen collection we've created will most likely outlive certainly myself um, and possibly everybody on this call. So cut to 2020, uh, the pandemic has accelerated this digitalization of our world. And uh, just have to kind of uh, uh, go to any conference or, or pick up any uh, uh, publication in this XR space um, and hot topics are metaverses and virtual beings and deep fakes and all set against the backdrops of buzzy AI and machine learning and, and 5G. So I started working remotely on Friday the 13th of March this year. Um, and I suddenly found myself socializing with friends and working with colleagues in virtual spaces um, in a VR headset. 
So I, I dusted off some of my old VR accounts. I, um, I created some new ones. Um, and as it turns out, I've spent more time, more effort this year dressing my virtual bodies, um, virtual avatars, than designing how I dress my actual body. So here's a sampling of some of my avatars. Um, there are versions of me um, that sort of represent my presence um, in Rec Room and Alt Space and Engage and Spatial and Big Screen and um, you know, Oculus, Mozilla Hubs, Spatial. Um, and all of them is different. All of them is created based on uh, the construct and the limitations um, of the, the particular platform. Um, but in other ways, they're sort of creatively freeing uh, that I get to sort of choose the elements of, of each one of them. Uh, here is a particularly terrifying one um, where you upload a, a photo of your face uh, and it's sort of put onto this um, 3D rigged model of your face um, and so it blinks but not when you blink and it smiles and it looks around and um, yeah you get to sort of pick the settings for for your own face um, and these kind of avatars that I'm creating they, they just seem very different to me um, than my my avatar for LinkedIn for example or even Bitmoji which is something that you know you do get to choose and you get to pick your hairstyle and pick your outfit um, but those are still fundamentally like kind of display outputs for, for a 2D screen um, that sort of interject, sort of punctuate a conversation um, or, you know, exist, uh, you know, just as your, your header image. Um, and so they don't really sort of engage or interact. Um, and yet these kind of virtual avatars that have some kind of physicality, some, some volume to them, suddenly your own identity sort of exists within that body. Um, I haven't yet created my... Facebook avatar, but I, I, I don't see a way to avoid it. I think that that's the way of the future. So in some ways, these representations are, they're very me because I got to make the choices, right? They reflect some aspects of my personalities. Um, but in other ways, some of them erase some of my social identity, the identity that is given to me by the construct in which we live, um, you know, as a, as a white female in my thirties. Um, and so all of that information that that context tells you just by looking at me, um, can be lost um, in this medium. So to go a step further, uh, this is also me. Um, it is a self-portrait. <laughs> I, so I was present at the moment of this recording. Um, so it is a replica of sorts of my body. It is a machine's perspective of me. Um, but it represents me in, in a more salient way though as well. Um, it's also, it's an image that I find personally, just very beautiful and compelling. I like the abstraction. I like the way that I can look at these colors and forms and think of deserts at twilight or the industrial architecture of a factory. And um, in some ways, this picture is an insight into what's going on in my mind. And so a representation of my identity in a way that you know my physical body doesn't convey. So it's not just me that is using this moment to do some self-inventing in the digital sphere. Uh, so here's an example of the weekend, um, paving the way for a multiplicity of celebrity incarnations of just one personal identity. Um, so he's been really active um, in uh, performing concerts across a variety of different platforms um, and not necessarily inhabiting his own body to do so. So he's been engaging with the you know, different types of animation and, um, and 3D modeling and, um, and different platforms and different types of interactivity. So the question becomes, you know, how many times can you copy yourself and, and still be yourself? Um, if, you know, is, must you inherently have a connection between your body um, and your identity uh, in order to you know, be yourself? Or does this now open the door where we can totally disconnect um, and replicate ourselves um, across different spaces? I believe really strongly that there's a, there's a sea change of what right now um, that we're not really fully talking about. And I, I can't overemphasize how, how profound this moment is. Um, as we migrate towards increasingly online lives, the shared cultural consensus of what our visual signifiers of what a human is, what a human looks like, um, that's being decided right now, you know, whether it's through these tech titans who are delineating what a digital landscape consists of by putting out 
you know, a certain menu of choices of, you know, what shape your face can be and, you know, what color your sweater can be in a digital incarnation. Um, the people who are participating now basically get to define um, what matters in, in how we are going to be communicating our identity. Um, I don't see a world in which we're going to reverse and we won't, um, I guess, continue down this path where we, we allow these kind of um, online versions of ourselves and virtual versions of ourselves to kind of um, drive the way forward. Um, I don't see a return to just being physical in the physical world and that being, you know, the be all and end all of um, how we're defining ourselves as, as people and how we're presenting our identities to each other. So what does this mean for documentarians who are trying to capture representations of real characters? Um, I don't know, but collectively, I guess as a, as a community, we, we get to decide. So today I work at a, a company called Scatter. It's an award-winning creative studio based in New York. Um, we make a, a popular volumetric capture software called DepthKit. Um, and this lets you capture your world in 3D. So essentially you plug in a depth sensor and record uh, volumetric video directly onto your computer. DepthKit um, has been used by creators all over the world um, and they can tell their stories either with kind of creative visual effects um, or sort of high quality photorealistic captures. And now we're, um, we're also piloting a full body 3D capture so you can have uh, multiple depth sensors connected and kind of get a hologram from all perspectives um, uh, of a, a real person in the world, have a, a replica of them. So depth kit, um, how it works is it records both depth and color um, and that sort of lets the creators then build imaginative aesthetics on top of that data. So I've got a couple of examples here. Um, uh, right on the, the left, we have uh, a concert that was done in VR. Um, that's, so that's Imogen Heap that you see, and she's kind of exploding into all these sparkles, but you can you know, get up close and sort of still look her in the eye and see her face. Um, we have a, a music video in the center called Blossom Through, um, which sort of combines elements of a, of a, a capture, a, a, a video recording of a, a real person, volumetric video. Um, with a sort of hybrid uh, kind of aesthetics where she's sort of uh, turning into uh, a, a more, more imaginative version of a person. And then all the way, all the way on the right, um, we have um, the legendary Kajiro Takahashi, who's been doing a lot of visual experiments um, create, uh, with DeathKit um, and Unity's VFX graph, uh, and really turning real movements to so real people that are captured in the world um, in this case, the, the dancer, a dancer called Jendai, um, and then sort of uh, divorcing that from what we expect a body to look like and, and creating all these beautiful, um, exciting ways to, to represent bodies and form. So, I mean, however it is you, you're gonna choose to portray your world, and I think that the, you know, the, the menu of choices is, is all in front of you, with DepthKit, for us, um, the engine at the source of, of, of what you, you're portraying is always going to be a, a real person. So an actual human being in the world who is recorded at some time um, and their actual genuine, authentic human gestures. And I think that, that as humans, we're really wired to recognize and, and relate to that essence of a person. Um, and for me, in nonfiction storytelling, this type of reality capture is a way to kind of keep the performance of the signified in the hands of the signified, or in other words, um, let the person whose identity is being represented um, at least be present at the moment when their identity is being captured or recorded. Recognizing that there's a whole host of layers <laughs> between and filtering, you know, the framing um, that's gonna exist between that signified and their signifier, um, this at least keeps the representation of identity within immersive media connected to this authentic human experience. So I will wrap up with some last thoughts on the construction um, of that representation. Um, and so this to me is sort of uh, today's playground, this documentary craft. And this is where we get you know, storytellers, we get to experiment, we get to invent this medium. Um, and the possibilities are really, really broad right now. Um, things that I'm expecting to see coming going forward, I'm pretty sure I will see an interview that's con conducted in VR via avatars. Um, I am pretty sure I'm gonna see storytelling that's happening live, um, that's not pre-recorded, but that somehow you're participating in in real time. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing it already, this kind of blend between the real and the virtual. And I think that that's, you know, opening up the door for a lot of really exciting things in the way that perhaps uh, real footage and, and reenactments in traditional documentary can kind of lend themselves to kind of holistic storytelling, um, real and virtual spaces, uh, I guess, add to that canvas. Um, but I think ultimately, uh, when it comes to sort of the identity of, of who we're portraying, we, we're accountable to the people that we're portraying. And I think that we should be very wary of replacing representations with simulation and sort of divorcing uh, the people we're telling stories about um, from how we are uh, visually presenting them. Um, and I guess the last thing is that in nonfiction, to me, agency really matters. Um, and so then thinking about uh, who who your protagonists are, um, are they being represented as, as products or puppets in any way if they are no longer in the, their identity is no longer in the driver's seat? I mean, if you are portraying a, a puppet, you know, thinking about who is the puppet master behind that. Uh, so one last final, final thing, um, uh, just a, a quote that, that bodies are, are sites in which social constructions of differences are mapped onto human beings. I think digital bodies are no exception um, and they're going to kind of continue to echo uh, social uh, constructions, social hierarchies that we see in the world. Um, and so I'm interested in exploring uh, how to both break those things um, and uh, uh, redefine, I guess, what the digital space looks like. And now I would very, very much like to hear from the rest of these very wonderful guests. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. That was, that was really interesting to think about um, this digital representations. I'm gonna open it up to the fellows to see if anyone has any questions. And then um, to the audience, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and um, I will read them to Caitlin. So uh, who wants to start from our fellows group? Um, no one. Yeah, can I? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Uh, first, uh, I, I have to say thank you for your presentation. Very, very interesting. Uh, let me start my video. Yeah. Hi, uh, very interesting because uh, the, the idea of identity is, is a, you say at the, at the end, is a, the body is a political, but at the same time it's a, a butter, a, 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 a place for, for fights. It's a, a, a butter ground, no? you know? It's a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a place in a, in a, a very huge uh, fights social and, and in, in different meanings. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea of identities uh, like a performative uh, expression, for me, is, is, is a, a, a way to understand what happened right now. And, uh, for example, when I, I, I think in the literature, for example, in the expression of Pessoa, Fernando Pessoa, the, the writer from uh, Portugal, he writes uh, in a in a in a very interesting way. He he works. He used the heteronymous for always represent himself as another, and he also he used permanent uh, uh, always the the idea of he is a character that transformed uh, in a many ways um, in 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 uh, each day for living life. No. So I, it, it, in your work, it happens something like that. It's a, some kind of performative way to express identities, not like a fixed idea, not like a, just one idea and th that you have to defend permanently for living. I don't know if I, I am right or not. Yeah, I mean, you definitely bring up a lot of interesting things there. I think for me, there's, I guess, two layers to that. So there's, uh, 
uh, I guess the identity of the the documentary subjects that you're you're telling the story about, you know, the folks that you think you know make the most interesting story, and the you know the reason that you want to tell the story in the first place. There's the identity that they think about themselves and how they would want to be portrayed, and, and sort of their um, their ambitions there. Um, and then there's this other lens, which is uh, you know, as a, as a storyteller, how do you uh, how do you navigate that? How do you you get to kind of uh, negotiate what that identity is going to look like? Um, and then you know, particularly as you you know, open up the toolkit and say, okay, you don't necessarily, from my perspective, I don't necessarily approach a project being like, well, so it's got to be a film, and that means we have to make it in a certain way. It's really about sort of matching um, the story that's going to be told with the medium that, that's going to tell it. Um, and so then, you know, you have quite a lot of possibilities on the table about how uh, you get to sort of construct what that, um, what that, that identity is going to be. Um, and so this idea of performativity, um, you know, there's this, uh, it, I guess it, it opens up sort of when, uh, when, when the moment of, of capture or recording happens. So in traditional, I guess, uh, like 2D filmmaking, um, it's one moment, right? A performance happens during a scene, you're on set, and that's captured and then after that moment it's very much in the hands of uh you know whoever recorded that footage um i think that there uh, that's not necessarily inherently true of immersive media now um especially when you're building things in real time um they allow you, you know to interact in game engines in real time it's possible to do have kind of live performances um and live um i guess uh, uh ways for people to express themselves uh, that, that aren't necessarily governed by this uh, particular intermediary. Um, I don't know if there's this, I don't have a really a thesis on like sort of what the right way to do, uh, to do it is, or sort of what um, is, I guess, uh, if there's a particular trend or direction that it's headed in. But I think, you know, what's interesting is just that, um, I guess the landscape is opening up that there's this multiple things that people can explore. Um, I think what's ultimately necessary um, for that performativity is some level of agency. Um, from the subject to be able to, you know, get to uh, get to enact that, you know, through whichever mode they want to. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I'll jump in. Um, Caitlin, first of all, thank you so much for showing us. Um, it's just great to see work that's happening uh, in another from another continent and I really appreciate that and it's great stuff and I we have to find ways to see more of it um, and secondly thanks for bringing up the ethical dimension to this it's important but I'm going to use that as a as a kind of a pivot point to talk about something I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent about but 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 it's, it's it's important to say one of the ways we use a lot of these technologies especially the things with kind of algorithmic systems in them is to is to kind of retrofit them to to the norms and values the ideas of subject the interpretive ideas of hermeneutics the idea of representation we're trying to sort of work with that within the domain that we know the domain that we have you know a couple of thousand years of experience with makes perfect sense but it seems that, and I picked this up a few times when you were talking about the machine image, the machine seeing, incarnation, simulation. Actually, a lot of what's happening can be, and, and performativity above all, it can be imagined through another lens. So, I mean, you know, the theory, the world is full of theories, but there's been, in the last 10 years or so, uh, the emergence of, for example, non-representational theory or post-representational theory that's trying to get away from that kind of subject-centered optics of the world and imagine a, a, a world that exists without us being the viewer. Performativity is often one of the key things they look at, um, or ideas of presence and embodiment without, without, you know, without it being something like an image that we could talk about in semiotic terms, signify or signified. Um, so all to say, what, what it raises to me is a, a question of, I feel, I feel like we're kind of in a in-between zone between two epics, an epic that we know and have, and have developed wonderful traditions around for the subject and the object for representation versus a, an emerging present where there's algorithmic remediation. Things are responsive and recursive. They're reacting to us without us exactly. We want, that, we want to pull that back into the world we know. Um, and I see that, especially in those, those, little, those little handheld universes you had. I mean, those, those images were compelling to me in terms of articulating, potentially articulating that new space. And I just wonder, are you feeling the limits of that kind of semiotic theory, trying to 
put new wine into old bottles, so to say? Or, or do you feel like limits to that, to that framing? And maybe there's another way to go at this that embraces the newness of the new? It's an innocent question. And it's just it's one I'm thinking about a lot. So. Yeah, I mean, I certainly say that, that um, you know, semiology is, is, is just one lens to, to approach this. And it's, it's certainly not a framework that is, you know, going to confine how I think about things. Um, but I guess what's interesting is you're, you're talking about uh, performativity and, and perhaps, uh, you know, divorcing of bodies and having, uh, you know, a, a purely algorithmic interpretation of the world. Um, I am not going to be interested unless there's still fundamentally some story there. And the story to me, you know, is centered on character um, and conflict and all the things that we, we, we know and love. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily mean that a character has to be a human and it has to be a human in a human body of human form that we know. Um, but I think that it has to somehow connect to our, you know, personal experience of what being a human is. Um, otherwise, it just becomes a bit rote, it becomes mechanical and routine. And there can be pleasure in, you know, experiences that, you know, it's like listening to music or, you know, engaging in, in, a, in a game um, that doesn't have a narrative quality to it. And I mean, I'm all for that, but I see that as sort of outside of, you know, my realm. Um, of storytelling and particularly nonfiction storytelling. Um, but where it shows up, I mean, it's a bit of a slippery slope. Where it, so I agree. Uh, but where it shows up as a bit of a problem is what do you do? So think of the training sets we use for, for facial recognition. Those sets are, are really interesting data that have, the, the faces have left the subjects that they once represented and are now doing very different work work that those subjects may or may not know about. The subject is no longer, in a certain sense, relevant. And we can, we can and probably should, and especially where we stand now, be ethically like quite, quite critical about that. But I think there's probably another way to frame that that says, well, you know, be careful, be careful, because what we're doing is actually moving into a new space. And it's a space where the subject and where representation are not key, even though all the kind of trappings of them are, are, are sort of, the, I'm, yeah, for, I'm sorry, this is, we just were talking about this in class the other day with, um, with, um, um, sort of the shift away from hermeneutics. And so it's a little bit fresh in my mind, but your, your projects really raise that question in a big way. Do we need a new framework of assessment? You know, maybe even with narrative in the picture, just in terms of understanding the ethics, ultimately, like what's, the, what's our speaking position for the ethics of using the imagery of the real when it's a machine that's doing the work and a machine that's doing the, the work, yeah, doing the work. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all really, really interesting stuff. Um, I guess the question is, like, can we come up with an ethical framework um, in real time while it's happening? Or do we need to wait for decisions to be made and for the dust to settle? And then we can figure out, like, oh, well, this is what the impact is and this is what it means. Or can we somehow, um, you know, uh, have a responsible approach where we decide, you know, this is what we stand for. And here are some, you know, uh, uh, frameworks that we're going to use to approach this. Um, and so as we think about uh, we're building a metaverse, we're building a digital world, and, and what does it mean for um, human beings to interact in those spaces? Uh, how do we construct that body? Um, you know, it, it's going to end up being just a facsimile um, in some shape or form, unless we have a different approach. Um, I, I mean, it's really interesting to explore what, what different opportunities are on the table. Um, and I'm, I'm, op I'm open to all of them, <laughs> open to all of them. I think that ultimately we're going to need to come to some consensus though, um, or at least have multiple people kind of having these conversations and converging on ideas um, before we can really say we've adopted an approach that we're going to take to, to world building. Um, but I think it's really important to be having these conversations now because that world building is happening, you know, regardless of whether we're, you know, figuring out ethics or, or kind of exploring abstraction or, or any kind of mode in it. Um, but to your other point about machines now doing the work, um, I think I'm a bit cheeky maybe in, in, in sort of using the language around machinery to describe a depth sensor in a way that I don't um, when I describe a typical video camera. But ultimately, it's the same, right? It's, it's still a, a piece of technology, a hardware that's being built that is interpreting the world in a certain way. Well, so I would just... Uh, people, put, people, uh, people put up your hands if you have stuff to say. I'll, I'll talk about this all night. But um, I, I think there's a fundamental difference. Like if we think about the photographic tradition, and I would include video within that, there's a kind of a, the old claim to indexicality, which I don't buy, but there is a correlation. If we think about at least the way LIDAR-based systems work, and I'm not saying that's depth kit, but there's like kind of pure data on one hand, 
to the extent that that can be pure and algorithms that make it dance. But without the algorithm, it's nothing. It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of data points. And the algorithm, you, if, you, if you want gravity to work, that has to be factored in, that has to be programmed into the way this. So it's, I think it's quite a different problem. And, and it's, it's, it's that level of like, what is the materiality of the image? And it's, it's, so I think there's a huge epical divide, but I'll send you something I wrote on it just, just to help you sleep at night. And um, it's a really great, it's a, thank you. It's a really interesting and provocative um, set of questions you've raised. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to hold you to that. I definitely want to read it. It looks like there's a question from Anita. Anita Rao. Hello, Anita. Oh, should I, I know if you want me to actually read it aloud. Yes, you can just okay. ask it. Reminds me of popcorn reading. Um, okay, cool. So I, first off, your work is extremely intriguing. Um, I'm a psychiatrist and the sense of agency and disembodiment, it's, it's a very interesting one because we contend with people who, who do that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my question was, uh, you know, uh, the idea of the body and its valence that we attribute to it um, becomes somewhat subverted in the way that you presented it and really ephemeral in a way. Um, and I was wondering if you think this creates more potential um, for humans to identify with what it means to be human and the inner life of humans rather than the external body, which can be so um, limiting and constraining and its implications for racism, sexism, etc. if people are give more valence to the inner life than what immediately hits you, which is that visual component of the external body. Yeah, thanks for the question and very nice to connect. Um, I mean, there's, there's a few components to that. I think, so it, it kind of goes back to this idea that there is the way that an individual wants to represent, them, represent themselves and have themselves represented to other people, but then there's also, I guess, uh, what other people are expecting to see. Um, and so uh, I guess if you kind of refer back to the, that self-portrait of me, uh, without me explaining what that is, it's just going to look like a gray blobby mass. And so as much as I can say that I don't want you to, you know, see this body of mine because this is not a body that I chose. Um, I just want you to see this thing that represents, you know, my intellect or, or my passion or something. Um, uh, I, without that context, without the, the receiver understanding that information, um, without, you know, the entire, you know, experience of, of human history that's, that you know, people have kind of formed our modes of communication around, you know, gesture and, and, body, and bodies, um, it's, it's not sort of communal. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's almost kind of wishful thinking. But that being said, if we can, you know, collectively as you know, storytellers and artists start building these tools that exist, you know, beyond bodies or think about bodies in different ways um, uh, and start to see that, you know, those kind of vocabularies developing and, and being shared and you know, evolving and building off each other um, all the time, uh, then I think that we've got something else, uh, you know, we'll have an, another tool in our arsenal that says, you know, a representation doesn't necessarily just have to be a picture of a person. It can be something else. Um, but it, it's not going to happen, I guess, overnight or, or all at once. Do, sorry, actually, you know what? There's so many questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it cute and keep it on mute. Um, Abby, do you want to read your question or say your question rather? Yeah, well, sure. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you, Caitlin. This was a super interesting talk, and it's always really fascinating to hear theory applied in practice in a lot of ways, um, especially since I'm in one of the classes that William was referring to. So my question was sparked a little bit by his, and I was wondering, so one thing that I was really curious about when you're presenting um, these projects was what I thought was kind of this anthropomorphic um, language around the images that were produced, that this is quote unquote how the machine sees. But it strikes me, for instance, if we're actually looking at the history of computing, right? Um, the artist Trevor Paglin has written that um, unless the machines are producing images for humans to actually interpret, that they no longer even produce those images because they don't need them in order to do the work that they do. So I'm really curious around like your thinking behind all of these projects, framing everything in this way that quote unquote machines see or 
like what's what's behind that? Yeah. Um, so I guess most projects that I work on, I don't actively spend a lot of time uh, uh, caring about the tools, or at least um, centering the tools in the practice of documentary making. Um, in a way, a lot of documentary making is is trying to um, uh, uh, make people forget that those tools are there um, and kind of hide the artifice of, of const the construction of, of that world, right? Um, in that, in the watertight project in particular, um, we were just operating at, at such a kind of, you know, forefront of what was possible that things were just, uh, 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 there was no way that we could uh, kind of predetermine what, what we wanted because the technology didn't exist to make that. And then actually, in fact, that is kind of the approach that we started at. You know, we started um, the project uh, wanted to do, do 360 capture, and at that time, um, we were waiting around for a, a GoPro rig that, that uh, didn't materialize, and so we got started with the tool that we had at the time. Um, and so then, as much as we wanted to explore um, the characters that we were, you know, and the, the, the topic we were exploring through the characters we were meeting, that we were finding, um, the, the technology itself was kind of like almost just putting up its hand at every, every moment and interrupting us and being like, oh, well, you wanted a perfectly uh, photorealistic capture of this thing. Well, here, here's a kind of blurry color smear instead. Um, and so, you know, one, one approach there is to think, okay, well, the, the tool doesn't do the job and then just throw it out the window. Um, but in this particular project, I guess we had the opportunity, opportunity to sit with it um, and really consider uh, alternate meanings um, and ways in which uh, what was being spat out, which was unexpected, um, could be beautiful and could be a, a means of interpreting that's kind of outside of, um, of our expectations going in. Um, and so I can't necessarily say that that tool is uh, necessarily objective, but it certainly doesn't have the same subjectivities um, that myself and my, my co-creator Ziv were, were walking in with. Um, and so in that sense, it became really interesting. Um, I wouldn't necessarily argue that that means now we should, you know, um, scale that and be like, well, this is the tool we use when we want to capture a certain type of thing. Um, it became really interesting to kind of have a conversation um, with a tool that's being used against its design purpose, really, um, for that project. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm interested in exploring, you know, what other tools could exist. Um, you know, what are the other kind of uh, methodologies and progress that, you know, you can kind of unpack and break down and how does that provide us a new a lens to to look at the world with um but then again i'm, I'm also primarily interested in, in in concentrating on people concentrating on characters and sort of doing them justice and i think there's always uh, i guess risk when you're kind of um foregrounding the the technology itself that you're you're actually um uh not being fair to you know the folks that you're actually trying to represent in a way that um you know they would feel comfortable with Great. Amber, do you have a question? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Caitlin. I have a question. When you use tools such as DevKit, do you think that the perception of your characters and identity also change as they do within like the virtual world? And also you as a storyteller, uh, do you think that your own perception of the identities of your characters change when you see them with like a different lens or like, you know, with this new technology? Yeah, um, so when you're asking, um, does, does my perception change? Are you asking about my perception, particularly as a documentary filmmaker or just in general, do perspectives change um, when using these tools? Well, one is like the character's uh, perception of their own identity and also you as a documentary. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's there's different types of documentary approaches. Um, so in my work as a producer, I am very fortunate to be able to collaborate with a, uh, you know, a variety of different directors and, and different each one, each one comes with their own storytelling approach. Um, so particularly with documentaries, uh, sometimes there is a very clear idea of what the story is to be told and there's a script in place and then it's sort of it's it's all mapped out before you um but i think most of the types of projects that i've worked on um have been a lot more organic um where there's an idea around what the story could be um, and then there's this almost kind of negotiation between um people that you meet who you think might be characters for the story or maybe you already know who those characters are um and letting them kind of tell you what that story is and so a key vector there is time, time that you're spending 
um, with those, those documentary subjects. Um, when you go out, you know, with a video camera and you put that between you and the subject, it creates um, a certain type of, uh, uh, sometimes a barrier. I mean, it depends how long you're spending with people, but it um, sets up a certain hierarchy and relationship. You know, the person is being observed. And so when you kind of start to bring in other types of tools, um, there's perhaps a different type of relationship that exists. Um, and, uh, you know, the more time or less time or so what the, the, the nature of that production period looks like can inform sort of what you know about that subject, what you know about that person um, and how much they're, they're willing to share with you. Um, so I guess a lot of the different types of tools that I've been using, um, maybe you know, biased by my, my, my background in traditional filmmaking, um, do kind of lend themselves to a traditional production workflow. Um, and so um, depth kit, for example, looks very familiar to filmmakers. Um, it essentially can function like you know taking a camera into the field, um, just a depth sensor instead. And so you still have a, a kind of relationship of um, a kind of subject in front of a lens. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that uh, creates a certain dynamic and, and unfolds in a certain way. Um, I think that, uh, I guess where, where I saw some differences in starting to do some more 360 filmmaking, uh, having, I guess, uh, you know, as I was mentioning, like not having that director necessarily in the same room um, with the camera because you kind of want to leave the camera alone so you can kind of get out of the way and not be in the shot. That did start to like feel like something different where it felt like um, uh, after a while, the sort of characters forget that the camera is there in a way that doesn't always happen when you're still like, you know, with your boom pole behind the camera. And so you start to get a certain, um, you know, different type of, of, of action taking place. Um, Obviously, then it's still up to you how you're going to cut that and use that, and you know what's ethical about, um, you know what you can show of people um, under observation and seemingly not under observation. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, uh, you know, the tools are are uh, uh, not going to govern that relationship that you have with your subject. It's really going to be between you know the filmmaker and the creator and what they're willing to share. Yusuf, you had a question. Yes. So, Caitlin, I, I really appreciate what um, you presented today. I find it uh, not only interesting, but uh, it made me think about a conversation that I had with James George. Um, and you should probably know him very well. Um, I was with James when he started developing the prototype of uh, this tool that you've been using. And uh, we spent an afternoon uh, having a quite existential conversation about the implications of this tool. And not only of this tool, but technology in general. Um, and now I'm wondering, um, if it's possible that tools could carry an intention, could carry an existential, ethical, or philosophical um, meaning that then would be activated by the users of this technology. I don't know what you think about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to turn it back on you and ask you, you know, what, what uh, kind of intention you'd, you'd want to carry. Um, I'll do my best to, to answer your question first. Um, I think what's really extraordinary about uh, the team at Scatter and um, uh, the tool depth kit um, is the history that it carries with it. So it's uh, 10 years in the making now. Um, and it was really born out of this kind of artist community, a community of creative technologists who, um, wanted to explore uh, new possibilities. Um, and so the original iteration of it, you know, existed before even, uh, before even the Oculus, you know, DK1, before, um, uh, before that was, the Oculus was purchased by Facebook, before VR became a thing, right? Um, it existed as kind of a creative tool, um, you know, for creative possibilities. Um, and so over the, the span of time since then, there've been, you know, huge, you know, uh, changes in the industry and sort of what's possible in terms of how you put things out there and people's expectations for it. Um, but all the while the tool has been growing um, through a conversation, I guess, with the creative community. And so it's been used, DepthKit has been used on such a variety of different types of creative projects. And every time um, somebody tells a story with it, they use it in a different way. Um, so whether that's 
you know, uh, using it um, with a particular intention in mind. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, on the project uh, Zero Days VR that's got it on their Emmy for, uh, uh, it was used, uh, uh, I guess, to um, uh, uh, tell the, present the character who is code, who is a Stuxnet, Stuxnet virus, uh, you know, telling the story of cyber warfare, um, using this type of technology to um, uh, create a portrayal of a, a non-person um, and, uh, and I guess, I guess, an informant um, of uh, what was going, what was going on at the time, um, uh, kind of a, a means to obfuscate that identity uh, without, uh, I guess, dehumanizing um, that informant. Um, and then, you know, it's been used on, you know, it, so many other different types of creative projects as well. And each time somebody sort of brings their own perspective to the tool and that sort of gets to inform um, what the tool is. Uh, and so, uh, yes, as it's, as it's grown and taken shape, um, you know, volumetric video um, as, as the kind of formats and volumetric filmmaking as the field um, is being defined by the people in the ecosystem. It's being defined by creators you know, like yourself um, who kind of get to, to figure out what it's going to be used for. Because um, without sort of knowing the why of it, uh, you know, it ultimately would just be, you know, another, another tool in a box that, you know, you know, wouldn't really serve any particular function. Um, but kind of having a viewpoint around what stories you want to tell and how to tell them and an approach which is experimental in its nature, um, I guess is really kind of meant that it's a tool that's, that's very much of its, its creative ecosystem. Great. I would love to hear from you before we move on about what kind of intention you'd want to hold for, I guess, tools that, that creators are building um, for how we tell our stories. I'm, well, my question had to do if it's possible that tools could carry that intention rather than projecting the intention um, by using the tool. And this is, I think I'm taking it to a more um, abstract and complex level um, in philosophical terms, because a tool, the way we have seen uh, throughout the history is just a tool, right? Something that you can use employ, activate, and then throw or disuse. Um, but now that we are entering this new era where tools are becoming smart or um, more active, more, um, they have a, a, a sort of life uh, within themselves. I'm wondering if tools could also bring intention uh, could carry intention. And um, that's because most of what you said, uh, and, as, and as, uh, as William pointed out, had to do with uh, the notions of artificial, of uh, simulated, of construct. And we, we think about all these terms as mostly as a fiction, as something that doesn't match the reality as it is. Um, and the, the, that's, um, that's why I'm, uh, trying to understand if it's possible to place, um, something that would keep, um, a human value within the tool itself. And that would be transmitted to the people that would use this tool. I, I mentioned that because I know that James was quite um, existential about the development of uh, DevKit. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if this is, um, you know, unfolding um, in the use of the tool. And that's, I don't know, I feel intrigued by, by all of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm super intrigued by your question as well. And I think um, in order for there to be some kind of, um, I guess, viewpoint that any kind of tool imposes, that tool needs to have some kind of level of autonomy. And I guess how I think about whatever devices I'm using, um, I think about them as something that's inherently instigated by a creator, by a storyteller, by somebody who has a particular 
um, perspective. And so even though that the tool itself can you know, go in, in a few different directions, kind of imagine a driver is always you know, a, a creator behind the scenes. Um, so it's really interesting to think about the idea of like, um, what if that driver can be uh, you know, mediated by either a force that's trying to counteract some kind of intention or kind of remind you to um, you know, hold a certain um, viewpoint uh, in your, your construction of characters, um, or a tool that you know operates entirely by itself. You know that you know the content that's making itself in the world it doesn't need a director. Essentially, it doesn't need a storyteller. Um, it's it's certainly interesting food for thought. Great. There's some questions from the audience. So I want to make sure we get some of those in. Um, from Max Ellinger, he says, in situations where a one-to-one -one digital representation of a person isn't feasible. Do you envision ways of co-creating the abstraction with the participant? Yeah. Hi, Max. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, well, I guess, yes, in short, I definitely think it is possible, but I think um, this idea of uh, uh, what would these situations be where one-to-one -one digital representation isn't feasible? Um, and in that scenario, who is the representer, who's the person who's defining and constructing this identity and why, and who is the participant. Um, and that would sort of need to inform what the relationship is in creating that abstraction. Um, so to maybe make this more concrete, I guess I'm thinking of a scenario where, um, uh, I guess take today, uh, for any of the kind of uh, digital avatars that I showed, uh, a one-to-one -one digital representation um, of my body in these virtual spaces is not, um, possible or I guess available in, uh, you know, right at, at this exact moment today, um, I can't have um, a perfect replica, photorealistic replica um, of my body in a virtual world um, in the current, you know, platform landscape. Um, so in this case, can there be some kind of abstraction um, avatar, which is negotiated, not just, you know, by the menu that's preordained for me by whatever platform I'm using, but can I as the participant uh, co-create that abstraction? Um, no, in short, because there's, uh, there's a, there isn't a, there's a, there's a hierarchy that separates us. You know, I, I don't have agency um, in those spaces. I can only choose what's given to me. I can't, um, I can't co-create in those contexts. But where um, those relationships are flatter, where uh, a choice around what the representation is and the participant are on equal footing, then I think we should aim to try and co-create. Um, uh, or at least uh, if we're asking somebody to not be the body that they've been in all their life, um, that you know, uh, we've accepted as their representation, if we're trying to create something else that represents them and we're not talking to them at all, uh, I mean, that's it's very worrying <laughs> in my perspective. Um, and so yeah, I would hope we would have more ways to, to kind of collaborate um, or at least um, for the participant to lead uh, that, uh, that creation. Great. We have a question here from Ruben Irving. He says, you talked about how the space a person inhabits is entangled with their identity. It shapes us and we shape it. In a virtual space, we directly edit our avatar and possibly the environment, but are constrained by the parameters set by the underlying environment. What you're talking about? How does an engagement with this virtual world impact on our own identity and sense of self? Mm. Much like in the real world, I think it's got a lot to do with with ownership. Um, it's the very first project that I showed you, um, Azibuya, the occupation. Um, uh, 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 these artists uh, took occupation um, of this abandoned mansion um, and essentially were, were, were squatting there, but as kind of a, an act of, um, of artistic reclaiming of the space. Um, and so one of the first things that they started doing before they actually started trying to fix up the house and make it more, more livable, um, they started creating artworks all around the house, you know, whether that's um, painting walls, painting slogans on the walls, um, or um, you know, even just reconstructing different pieces of the house. So they had a creative approach to create a sort of a um, upcycled stained glass window. Um, all of these things are ways for them uh, to, I guess, take ownership of the space and embed themselves in that um, and kind of uh, get to reaffirm that uh, their value and their sense of belonging there. And I think that we start to apply those principles of uh, uh, 
uh, land and space and ownership um, and possessions and who gets to control what's around them. Um, you can apply that in a virtual space as well. Um, so there are uh, many virtual environments that uh, basically are user generated or allow you to kind of control what's in that space um, and you can sort of design the world you want and then invite people to join you in it. Um, and then there are other types of, of worlds where, uh, you know, you enter spaces that other people have designed um, and you don't get any kind of say in what those spaces look like. Um, and so for me, when I'm kind of, you know, moving through these spaces, um, it's the equivalent of like me feeling like I have a sense of control um, or I have a sense of belonging in a, in a space versus, um, you know, uh, feeling like I'm a, either a, a guest, a welcome guest, um, or uh, just a sort of, you know, bystander, a passerby um, who's kind of small in a space that doesn't um, get to, you know, have an opinion. Uh, yeah, I guess identity is a tricky one there. All right, so we have a question from Gordon Skinner. Um, the question of authenticity in cinema verite filmmaking has been there from its inception. Um, what mitigation efforts uh, have you explored and, uh, in the making of, of the subject and, and the avatar? Hmm. Yeah, mitigation. Um, I guess mitigation for um, for non authenticity, right? Um, when constructing, you know, what 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 is real? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, these are all the questions, right? You know, kind of putting on my my journalist hat. You know, what is truth and what is meaning and what is reality? And if we can at least decide that and that's fixed, then we can figure out how do we present that? How do we construct things that you know inform what that is? Um, and you know, cinema verite had. Uh, a certain style of um, uh, just you know, just describing a visual language that felt real and authentic um, because it kind of broke with some of the kind of uh, you know more glossy Hollywood constructs uh, that made you feel like things were maybe less authentic. Um, but it and in and of itself is still a set of visual grammar. It's a set of rules that um, cue certain things and how you you understand um, a shot and how a shot is presented um, and sort of that realness is still uh, a construction. And so I don't think we're ever gonna to get to a point of uh, uh, collapsing or, or removing um, that, that construction. I think that we can do more to draw attention to it where it's necessary, where um, uh, we're compromising, I guess, the identity of a subject. I think we need to be uh, really clear in, in ways in which we're making these, these artistic choices, these choices of representation and construction. Um, but then I asked myself, so what is the value of, of authenticity? Um, and I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that we wouldn't care about stories if it didn't feel like there were characters driving them who are relatable, who matter somehow. Um, and so I think that in some ways that sort of mitigates, that's the mitigating factor itself is we don't want to get to a level of kind of, um, uh, you know, gloss and high production where um, we feel so divorced from from what makes things real um, because the audience won't care about it. Oh, great. And I know Josh, you had a question. Um, yeah, uh, thanks so much, Caitlin, for sharing um, all of your different projects. And I guess I just I just have a, a very sort of small focused question, maybe just also a larger one about um, your work and the connections between your different projects. For the one that was mapping um, these sort of New York City interiors and sort of resulted in those sort of sculptural handheld, um, you know, little renderings, almost like amber, um, of, of the rooms. I'm curious sort of what happened to those. I mean, were they displayed together? Were they, were they given back to the individuals? Just curious to know from a kind of curatorial perspective what, what happened um, to those objects. And I guess maybe the, the broader question, a kind of theme through a lot of your different um, your different projects uh, seems to be um, this sort of intensely sort of intimate personal look at, at individuals. I mean, you, you've used the word character a lot, um, you know, individual lives and individual experiences, but also um, a concern with these very broad historical, you know, historical phenomena, larger social themes. And I'm just curious how you sort of navigate or think about the relationship between this sort of intense 
personal, individual kind of perspective and these very large pressing social issues, which is, I know, a, you know, has been a charge of documentary since, since the beginning. Um, I mean, there's definitely possibilities in, in, in moving that route, but also maybe do you see some, some limitations or, or some tensions in trying to na uh, navigate or toggle between, you know, the individual and the intimate and, you know, the his larger historical and social? Yeah, great questions. Um, so to your question about what happened to that watertight collection, we spent a lot of time iterating, like what does, uh, what does an archive look like? We're trying to archive housing infrastructure in this state of time in New York for people who live alone. Um, what is the scale of that? And like, how do we record that? And so we went through a variety of different iterations. Um, I think that the kind of language or the kind of framework that we wanted to, to use was, was uh, um, of kind of uh, specimen collecting and this kind of scientific approach. Um, and so you like to think about the, you know, these, these little um, sculptural prints as, as specimens. And, you know, they've in certain times lived in jars and um, anyway, they exist in the world today. They, uh, uh, they're replicable, right? Um, because they're 3D printed. Um, and so uh, we have a kind of limited series for each one. Um, they're now publicly available or as publicly as possible um, at a museum in Germany called Futurium, which is the museum of the future. Um, and so you can go and kind of witness them in an exhibit format if and when the museum is available in a publicly safe way. Um, and yeah, I guess that's sort of, uh, you know, we're pleased with that outcome as, as kind of uh, using, you know, these, these, this very particular type of portraiture um, as a as kind of lens to look at a, a broader um, uh, housing phenomenon and, and kind of present that as um, a kind of case study uh, for its time. Um, yeah, your second question um, around, I guess, uh, what, um, I guess, you want to repeat your second question? I'm sorry. Oh, it's just, I mean, how you think about the relationship between the individual and the personal and just these broader social you know, his historical, um, you know, pressing questions. I mean, so many of your projects, it's a very personal, intimate sort of look into somebody's life, into somebody's room, into somebody's habitat, but certainly gesturing. I mean, as the Container Project does, as the New York City Interiors does, I mean, towards, towards a very large, you know, socio-political theme or question. And I'm just sort of curious how you think about that going into projects and if there's some possibilities, but also maybe some tensions or, or, or limitations that you see in, in, in that approach. Yeah, I, I can't really say that that's been a, a conscious approach, but I think it's sort of um, almost a, a consequence of, I guess, the nature of uh, wanting to engage in documentary storytelling and, and pursue curiosity. And so I guess the two things that you've identified, if you go and want to tell a story and, and, and find an individual, a character that you want to get to know, you spend time with them you're going to increase that sense of intimacy as you kind of, they are going to share more with you. You're going to build that, that closeness, that rapport, um, and you're going to kind of get towards, you know, collapsing that space between you. But on the other side of that, um, the more time you sit with an issue, the more time that, you know, you recognize the impact of it, the more time you research it, um, the bigger that it gets, right? And the more it sort of feels impactful and sort of beyond the scope of this one person who's experiencing this one thing. Um, I think that that can apply to anything. I could, you know, if I, if I spent long enough with you, we would have both. We would have that close to rep representations portrayal of, of the intimacy of, of you, Joshua. Um, and it would also get to a bigger issue. I don't know what that issue is for you, but there's multiple issues that we're all, you know, coexisting in. I mean, I think the thing about issues is they're not um, outside of ourselves. You know, they're, you know, part of society that we're, you know, we're dealing with these things. Um, and so I, I don't know how we talk about a human experience without alluding to things that are going on in the world. Okay, well, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was a fascinating conversation. Um, and thank you to all of you for listening and participating. Um, we'll be back next week at the same time with a panel on preservation of digital works. So hope to see you then. Thank you.